Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LM News Special Lecture Series on International Business and Regional Studies. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of International Business and Management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Today's program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, our gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past six years and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures, and movie screenings. LMU is among the 16 universities in the country who received prestigious cyber grants awards from the US Department of Education. The LMU side serves as a regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education, foreign language training, and research capacities. We have a great program for you today. I have invited two renowned experts on the issue involving the Taiwan Strait. They will discuss how the outcome of the upcoming U.S. presidential election will affect the U.S. and China's approach to resolving the issue over Taiwan. China claims Taiwan as part of its own territory, and China's Communist Party has labeled uh, Mr. William Lai, newly elected Taiwanese president last January, as a dangerous separatist. Meanwhile, the U.S. has made a commitment to help Taiwan defend itself through arms sales, but keeps it unclear whether American troops would be dispatched to save Taiwan if Beijing ever attacked the island. Given these complicated backgrounds, I'm sure today's panel discussion will be enlightening to better understand how the upcoming presidential election will affect the complex relationships between the U.S., People's Republic of China, and Taiwan. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers. First, Mr. Ryan Haas. Mr. Haas is a director of the Center, uh, China Center and chair in Taiwan studies at Brookings Institute. He's also a senior fellow in the Center for Asian Policy Studies. Mr. Haas focused his research and analysis on enhancing policy development on the crucial political, economic, and security challenges facing the US in East Asia. From year 2013 to 2017, Mr. Haas served as a director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council staff. In that role, he advised President Obama and senior White, White House officials on the U.S. policy toward China, Taiwan, and Mongolia, and coordinated the implementation of U.S. policy toward this region among U.S. government departments and agencies. Prior to joining NSC, Mr. Haas served as a foreign service officer in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, Seoul, and Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital of Mongolia. Our next speaker, Dr. Bonnie Lin. She's a senior fellow for Asian Security and director of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Previously, she was the acting associate director of the strategy and doctrine program of RAND Project Air Force and a political scientist at the RAND Corporation, where she analyzed different aspects of China's foreign and defense policy. Dr. Lin's research advised the senior leaders in the Department of Defense, including military leaders at U.S. Pacific Air Forces and U.S. Army Pacific. Dr. Lin also served in the Office of Secretary of Defense from 2015 to 2018, where she was a director for Taiwan country director for China and senior advisor for China. Dr. Lin has testified in front of Senate Armed Services Committee, House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the US-China Economic Security Review Commission. Thank you so much, Haas and Dr. Lin, for joining our webinar today. I know both of you are very busy and often out of the country. So I feel very lucky uh, to be able to have both of you today. I'd like to ask Mr. Haas to start first your short presentation to give an overview of the issue involving cross-strait tensions between the PRC and Taiwan, 
Then, Dr. Lin, that uh, you'd probably that, uh, please uh, follow up with China's military strategies and tactics to showcase uh, its discontent about Taiwan's emphasis on its autonomy and independence. Well, Professor Peck, thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to join you uh, and your colleagues at the Loyola Marymount University uh, community. Um, it's uh, it's really an honor for us. Uh, I have only one goal tonight, which is to be supportive of your thinking. Uh, and so I have a few comments that are prepared to get us kicked off, uh, but I'll be happy to take the conversation in any direction that you or your colleagues wish from there. Uh, I plan to use the eight minutes that I have to try to tackle four questions. Uh, the, the first question is, what are the, the roots of cross-strait competition? Uh, the second, how do people in Taiwan view cross-strait tensions today? The third question is, how have President Trump and President Biden dealt with cross-strait issues over the past eight years? And then looking forward, how would a President Trump or a President Harris uh, deal with cross-strait issues going forward? Uh, if it's possible to use the PowerPoint slides now, that, that would be wonderful. But in terms of uh, the, the roots of cross-strait competition, so the next slide, the, the place where I would like to start uh, the history is at the end of World War II. Uh, af after the forces from Japan were expelled from China, uh, a civil war broke out between the Chinese Communist Party and the Republic of China uh, Guomindang forces. Uh, this civil war ended in 1949 with the Guomindang retreating from mainland China to Taiwan. Uh, the People's Republic of China was formed in 1949 uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. When the Guomindang forces retreated to Taiwan, 85% uh, of the population in Taiwan was native Taiwanese, uh, and 15% was from mainland China at that time. At that time, uh, the Truman administration was in power in the United States. They judged that it would not be possible to defend Taiwan if it was attacked from Chinese Communist Party forces if they sought to attack Taiwan to uh, finish the, the Chinese Civil War. That attack never took place uh, because the Korean War broke out shortly thereafter, and the Truman administration adjusted its approach uh, to decide to uh, defend Taiwan, which forestalled uh, the Chinese Communist Party's plans to, uh, to seize Taiwan. And then fast forward to today, and this civil war remains unresolved. The civil war has evolved from a primarily military conflict over time to a part military, part political struggle, whereas now it's mostly a political struggle with a military dimension. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the next question is, how are people in Taiwan looking at this dynamic uh, across the Taiwan Strait? The, the most important point that I would like to leave everyone with, if they only remember one thing from what I say today, is that Taiwan people overwhelmingly favor the status quo. Uh, over 85% of Taiwan uh, residents who are polled uh, would prefer the status quo. And this is why uh, Taiwan politicians, when they run for office, particularly for uh, Taiwan's presidency, they campaign not on whether or not they will deliver independence or unification, but on who would be the most effective leader at preserving and protecting the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. Now, different leaders in Taiwan have different visions for how they would secure the status quo going forward. Uh, many people who are more supportive of the Guomindang believe that the best way to preserve the status quo is to stabilize the situation across the Taiwan Strait uh, and to lower uh, tensions uh, with, with China. Whereas people who are more supportive of the Democratic Progressive Party which is the party that's the ruling party uh, in Taiwan today, believe that the, the best way for Taiwan to protect itself and, and protect the status quo is by strengthening military capabilities and strengthening relationships for Taiwan with other predominantly democratic powers around the world. Because the Taiwan people have lived with uh, the, the threat from uh, China for so long, they've become somewhat inured to the threat. Um, and I, I can tell you from firsthand experience that uh, sometimes prostrate tensions look very 
uh, dramatic from the United States, but they feel much less dramatic uh, when you're in Taiwan. I was in Taiwan uh, shortly after uh, then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi had visited Taiwan. Her visit um, uh, was followed by pretty significant military exercises by the Chinese to uh, object to Speaker Pelosi's trip to Taiwan. Uh, they overflew uh, the island of Taiwan with missiles uh, and conducted military exercises around the north, south, east, and west of Taiwan. But if you were on the streets of Taipei, as I was at that time, you could hardly feel uh, any difference. Daily life continued uh, largely uninterrupted. The, the people of Taiwan uh, face not just a military threat, but also an ongoing threat of coercion without violence. Uh, this is uh, acts below the threshold of military conflict to wear down the psychological will of the people of Taiwan. Uh, to compel the people of Taiwan to conclude that there is no path to peace and prosperity that does not run through Beijing, that resistance is futile, and that the earlier uh, the people of Taiwan accept their fate, that they are bound together with China, uh, the easier things will be going forward. And so the people of Taiwan really face two parallel uh, challenges to the status quo. One is the consistent, constant uh, military pressure the other are these actions um, short of the use of, of violence, um, whether it is United Front activities or cyber activities, disinformation, uh, efforts to meddle in electoral processes, all these things to try to sow division and, and sort of erode uh, the people of Taiwan's confidence in their own future. So the people of Taiwan are facing these simultaneous threats constantly. Uh, next slide, please. So how has the United States been responding to, to this challenge to their friends in Taiwan? Um, I'd like to just take a minute to walk us through how the previous two administrations have dealt with this in, in the United States. Uh, the Trump administration um, oscillated somewhat over the course of its tenure. President Trump, when he was uh, just elected and he was president-elect, he chose to um, break with past president and receive a congratulatory call uh, for his election victory from Tsai Ing-wen, uh, Taiwan's president at that time. He, when asked why he had chosen to do this, he suggested that it could create leverage for President Trump in the United States with China going forward. Uh, when that didn't work out as he had envisioned, uh, President Xi uh, refused to speak with President Trump until President Trump reaffirmed uh, his commitment to America's longstanding one China policy. Uh, President Trump uh, changed tack. Uh, he began to question why the United States was so committed to defending and protecting the people of Taiwan. What strategic benefit or gain the United States derived from the amount of uh, energy, effort, and expense uh, that, that it, it was providing to Taiwan's defense. Now, despite President Trump's uh, wavering views on Taiwan, it's worth noting that President Trump's staff was extremely supportive of Taiwan, particularly in the military and security and strategic sectors. Uh, they increased uh, United States arms sales to Taiwan. They increased public support for the people of Taiwan. They sent a cabinet level official and they adjusted uh, subtle but significant um, aspects of America's declaratory policy, the way that it spoke about its support for Taiwan. America's trade agencies under President Trump uh, were different. Um, they largely kept Taiwan in a freezer and did not engage with Taiwan on, on economic or trade issues. And, and the reason is fairly simple because President Trump had identified a, a phase one trade deal between the United States and China as his top priority in this space and felt that uh, any economic interaction with Taiwan could complicate or undermine his ability to achieve this larger goal. President Biden has taken a somewhat different approach. Uh, he has situated Taiwan at the front line of a global struggle between democracies and autocracies. Uh, he has um, um, really um, expressed his support for the defense of Taiwan. He has said for the, he's the first American president in history to say that the United States would come to Taiwan's defense. He said it not once, not twice, but four times uh, in public. And his administration has made a very concerted effort to try to build and broaden international support for Taiwan. 
so that Taiwan is no longer a annex of US-China competition or a issue between the people of Taiwan and the people of China, but an issue of global concern uh, where uh, a constellation of countries around the world are increasingly speaking up uh, to express their support for preserving the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. Next slide, please. So that's what happened over the past eight years. Now I wanted to just close by um, speculating a bit about what may happen over the next four, uh, because the American people in, in less than two weeks will face a choice between uh, former President Trump and Vice President Harris. Which one uh, is elected will determine uh, in, in large measure the direction of American policy towards Taiwan. I say in large measure because Congress also plays an important role. Uh, members of Congress have been very consistent in, uh, in their focus on Taiwan, and I expect that they will be going forward. But just to look briefly at, at former President Trump and Vice President Harris's views on Taiwan, President, former President Trump takes a very transactional approach, not just to Taiwan, but to foreign policy issues more broadly. He uh, has at various times uh, suggested that it would be helpful if Taiwan invested more in American uh, production in the United States particularly in the semiconductor sector. He has also suggested that it would be important for Taiwan to increase spending on its own defense. But part of the reason why President Trump uh, expresses confidence that there will not be a cross-strait conflict between China and Taiwan under his watch is because he believes that his image for toughness and unpredictability will keep China off balance and serve as assets to manage this complex situation. Vice President Harris takes a, a different approach. Um, she has not spoken much in public about Taiwan, but when she has spoken, she's really sort of honed in on three critical points. The first is that she is supportive of preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. She views that as a, the North Star of America's policy. Secondly, she has emphasized repeatedly, as uh, her lawyerly background would suggest, that she cares deeply about upholding principles. Uh, such as the principle that boundaries should not be redrawn by force, that territory should not be seized through military means. And to back up that point, she has vowed uh, that under her leadership, the United States would maintain uh, the world's most lethal fighting force in the United States uh, military. So in other words, I think that if elected Vice President Harris's approach, her views would likely fall within the broad mainstream of uh, Democratic and Republican administrations over the past 45 years uh, in their approach to Taiwan, with the exception of the Trump administration, which was um, somewhat unique. So I will uh, pause there uh, and turn things over to Bonnie, uh, but I really look forward to the conversation. I hope through these opening comments, we've helped uh, situate how the people of Taiwan approach prostrate issues but also uh, how the United States has dealt with and may continue to deal with Taiwan as a political issue going forward. Uh, Bonnie will, will fill in more of the details uh, on those issues as well as on the military and strategic background where she has deep expertise. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, echoing Ryan, uh, I very much appreciate this opportunity to be with the group today. Um, as Ryan uh, mentioned, he provided much of the history in the background, and what I'll try what I'll try to present is a bit more of the China challenge and the and how China looks at the situation, regardless of whether we have uh, Vice President Harris or President Trump back as the next leader of the United States. Uh, so, if you can load my slides, please. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, next slide. So looking at how China views the situation in Taiwan, I think it's important to highlight four different anxieties that China, well, four different aspects of China's overall consideration. I think the first is a recognition that over the years, uh, we've seen China, and particularly under Xi Jinping, shift its emphasis for, for, for Taiwan uh, from what it used to be in 2005, which is focusing on major acts uh, within Taiwan that China views as problematic, major acts um, that China view as bringing Taiwan to 
change from its status quo to de facto independence to now what China views as uh, U.S. and Taiwan's Lamy slicing of the status quo. And this is very important because um, over particularly in the recent years, we've seen China respond to what we in the United States as well as international community view as um, actions that are not actually too different from before. So as Ryan mentioned, um, China has engaged in a number of military exercises. I'll walk you through at least a couple of them, but some of them, particularly the most recent one has been over words that the current Taiwan president has mentioned. So what this means is over time in the past decade or so, we've seen China be less tolerant of Taiwan as uh, less tolerant in what it views as problematic activities in Taiwan, as well as more willing to respond to what it views as um, smaller transgressions or problems that uh, from the Taiwan leadership or from their perspective from the US leadership. Another trend that and anxiety that we're seeing within uh, China is that compared when China looks at what's happening in Taipei, China looks at the current president of Taiwan, William Lai, as more problematic than his predecessor. A part of this is a uh, anxiety and deep hostility and distrust that China has of um, President Lai that actually may or may not be based on what he, his actual actions. But this perception means that if President Lai does the exact same thing as his predecessors, China is likely to respond more negatively to President Lai and has lower tolerance for what China views as hit problematic activities from his end. There's also been a growing belief or uh, in the past couple of years um, that the U.S. Uh, policy for U.S. one China policy has been hollowed out. You'll see constant criticism from the Chinese side that the United States is not sticking to our one China policy. You'll see criticism from the Chinese side that the United States is fanning the flames of Taiwan independence or Taiwan separatism. I have a, a image of a cartoon here from Global Times, which is a um, rather uh, hawkish Chinese uh, media outlet. And you can see in this picture of William Lai depicted uh, sitting on a, it seems like an, uh, a, um, uh, a, a, I guess an oil, I uh, like, I guess, what do, you, what do you call this? With separate, that has its term separatism there. And then you see the United States depicted as providing the flame to perhaps uh, kick off the um, explosion that could occur if it were to touch um, uh, the what President Lai is sitting on. So this depicts um, in some ways how China is perceiving the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and how both actors are in many ways uh, contributing from Beijing's perspective to instability in, in the Taiwan Strait. The fourth thing that I would uh, flag for our listeners is that we've seen more and more frustration uh, from Beijing's end as there's been more parallels between Taiwan and Ukraine. And um, we've seen from, from China's end a uh, perception uh, that the United States is in many ways um, getting more involved in Taiwan, similar to the way that we're supporting Ukraine. And there are worries within China that the United States will is already and could further operate in Taiwan in ways that we are doing in Ukraine. In other words, Taiwan, um, there's a misperception in China that Taiwan could be an enhanced proxy for the United States and overall U.S. efforts to weaken China. So these anxieties and these concerns in many ways have been fueling in the past couple of years significantly more Chinese coercion Chinese activities against Taiwan. So next slide, please. So on the day-to-day -day level, Taiwan MND has been releasing Chinese military operations close to Taiwan. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of metrics there. I pulled out two metrics that my team um, helps follow. Um, one of them is the number of Chinese military aircraft that flies into Taiwan's air defense identification zone, which is the top graph. And the second metric is the number of Chinese naval vessels that are operating around Taiwan. As you can see here, uh, these graphs aren't too clear. So I created a table on the uh, right hand side where you can look at the total number of operations 
2023 compared to 2024. Again, we don't have the full year for 2024. And I was most interested in looking at um, China, China's, the shift in Chinese behavior under the new Taiwan president, Ty, um, William Lai versus a prior Taiwan president. So we're, so this table really only looks at May 20th, you know, October 16th. And what we are seeing here is um, in terms of aircraft, day-to-day -day aircraft operations near Taiwan, we're seeing 165% increase from 2023. And in terms of naval activity, we're seeing a 33% increase from 2023. Next slide. But in addition to the daily increase in Chinese military activity that we're seeing directly against Taiwan, we're also seeing an increase in, mu in much larger scale Chinese military activity against the island. So on this slide, uh, I highlighted four major Chinese military exercises uh, against Taiwan since 2022. And the image is of the August 2022 exercise compared to the last time such large scale exercise around Taiwan occurred. And it's important to know that that was in 1995 to 1996. So it's been uh, over two decades uh, prior to 2022 where we, where we haven't seen China engage in such a large scale acti military activity uh, near Taiwan with the use of live fires in the same way of, uh, and surrounding Taiwan. And um, what's interesting about the most recent four uh, military exercises is that um, there's four in the last uh, two years. And I can't emphasize how abnormal that is compared to before. And since this year, uh, May 2024, we've seen China uh, not only engage in these exercises, but name a dedicated exercise series for these types. So they're now called joint sword series. So right now, the most recent one that we saw in October 2024 is called Joint Sword 2024B. The May one from this year is, was called Joint Sword 2024A. And these exercises highlight China's intent to continually use large scale military exercises to demonstrate its displeasure against Taiwan, uh, to deter Taiwan, from China's perspective, try to deter Taiwan from engaging in more provocative acts, but also to signal to the United States um, China's uh, desire and firm commitment to try to unify with Taiwan. Uh, next slide, please. A couple of things about these military exercises and the trends that we're seeing over time that are that the next U.S. administration will have to deal with. Uh, the first is each of these military exercises was were accompanied by a range of PRC non-military activities against Taiwan. So in addition to uh, PLA activities and Coast Guard activities, for example, we saw China sanctioning US companies and Taiwan individuals. We've seen China also taking away Taiwan's diplomatic allies. We also see China threatening or actually imposing tariffs or economic punishment on Taiwan. So these military exercises um, are very highly visible displays of Chinese anger and determination, but they're often accompanied by a lot more, a full range of non-military coercion against Taiwan. At the same time, uh, as these exercises are occurring, um, the, the 2022 ones were announced in advance and we saw clearly exercise zones where uh, the more recent exercises were not announced in advance and we're shown maps of where they are, but they are there aren't clear coordinates given in terms of where the exercises are occurring. We also are seeing that China is operating closer and closer to Taiwan, as well as operating all around Taiwan, not just to the west of Taiwan. We're seeing in these military exercises that China is no longer just relying on the People's Liberation Army, which is their army, their, their military, but they're also relying on what China calls as its law enforcement uh, actors, the China Coast Guard. I think happy to talk more about this in, during Q&A, but the Coast Guard is not exactly our typical, China's Coast Guard is not exactly our typical Coast Guard. Um, two other things I want to flag in terms of this trend is we're also seeing more Chinese activity before and after these military exercises. In other words, um, for example, this October before this military exercise, we saw um, China uh, launching an ICBM into the, into the Pacific. We saw China uh, launching a satellite. 
after the exercise, um, actually today, we saw China engage in another uh, live fire, much smaller exercise in Taiwan. So uh, from 2022 until now, we're seeing Chinese operations um, have more of a, a lead into the military exercise and more of a lag in terms of normalization and increasing activities after the fact. The final thing I'll mention about these exercises that in, uh, that the next U.S. administration will have to pay attention to is a little bit more speculative, but I do want to bring in a concept that we are talking a lot more about in D.C., which is the idea of um, the potential for, of an axis of, of upheaval, which our colleagues at CNAS have written about. What was interesting uh, this October, October 14th, uh, during China's most recent exercise is on the same exact day of that exercise, the Russian defense minister arrived in China for military talks with the Chinese. And on that exact same day also, China's foreign minister Wang Yi had a phone call with the Iranian foreign minister. Uh, both of those events, because they're engaged with China, I would say Beijing had some degree of control in coordinating their timing. So it's interesting that they both occurred on the same day. And the last uh, thing that I'll flag is also around this time, we saw significantly increased North Korea activity and provocation, including moving of North Korean troops closer to South Korea um, uh, due to a variety of reasons, including uh, North Korea is alleging of South Korea using unmanned drones. Um, I, I don't think uh, China directed North Korea to do that, but I think it is important to watch how China's friendships develop and how these um, actors are could either be working in conjunction or one could take, uh, be taking advantage of other opportunities that may be arising when other actors are, um, are engaging in similar types of activity. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of what the next administration might face, in addition to what we're seeing in terms of general day-to-day -day increased Chinese uh, activity, coercion against Taiwan, particularly on the military side, as well as large um, spikes in periodic Chinese military activity and military exercises that surround all of Taiwan. I think a very plausible scenario that we might see in the next three to four years could is a uh, potential Chinese quarantine of Taiwan. In other words, China using law enforcement assets to surround Taiwan uh, and to try to uh, put in place some form of embargo around the island. This could have a variety of effects, including pressuring the Taipei leadership, as well as um, trying to instill a degree of fear within the Taiwan public. Um, I will, uh, this is a notional way that we think a quarantine could be implemented, but of course we have the full report on the CSIS website if you're interested. Next slide, please. The last thing I want to close on is uh, just to broaden out a little bit of why Ryan and I are focused quite a bit on uh, cross-strait dynamics and why peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait really matters. I think oftentimes when we give talks about what's happening in Taiwan, a question that we often get is, why does this matter? Uh, what this figure shows, or what this heat map shows, is how much trade, uh, how much does a country's total trade uh, go through the Taiwan Strait? And the brighter the color, the more the country's trade actually is dependent on trade on transiting the Taiwan Strait. Typically, when we think about Taiwan, we think, okay, the countries most impacted by a crisis or conflict in Taiwan are probably those right around Taiwan. Actually, what this map shows is that a number of countries, even much more distant, further out, including in Africa, are significantly impacted by uh, disruption of trade through the Taiwan Strait. So the brightest color here is actually from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, of which um, they depend on trade through the Taiwan Strait for about, um, I think almost 50% uh, of its trade. And what we see here is um, uh, that about 70% of its exports uh, from the DRC has to go through the Taiwan Strait and about 12% of its imports. So I just want to put this map here to showcase that even though to a number of countries, Taiwan may be very distant, when you think about the potential disruptions in trade and the larger global economic effects, Taiwan, uh, a crisis or contingency in the Taiwan Strait is likely to have significant global ramifications. 
So I'll wrap up my uh, comments here. And like Ryan, uh, happy to follow up uh, and discuss any points uh, that were not clear. Okay, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, I think that set the tone that, you know, the, for the follow-up questions. So let's begin with, uh, you know, I'm going to ask a few questions before we uh, take care of the, some of the questions from the audience. So my first question is, I asked my students in my class today, is Taiwan a country? So many of my students, they seem to be confused uh, with my question. Is this a right question? One of the students said yes, and another student mentioned that the you know, US has maintained the one China policy. So probably that Taiwan is not a country. Well, while the US we established the diplomatic relations with the PRC, we also signed the Taiwan Relations Act, TRA, which commits the US to providing Taiwan with defensive weapons and to maintaining US capacity to resist caution that would jeopardize Taiwan's security. So TLA creates a strategic ambiguity by not specifying whether the US would defend Taiwan in the event of a PRC attack. Um, even though the earlier presentation that Ryan, you mentioned that uh, you know the uh, president, uh, former president um, Trump, uh, actually that uh, he kind of dodged that, uh, the, the question. And even that the Biden administration um, was more engaged with uh, uh, the Taiwanese government in a comprehensive manner, still that uh, we don't know that what is the correct answer. So this is exactly, I think, that the main reason why the US wants the status quo. So here goes my question. How does the absence of diplomatic relations or recognition of Taiwan affect the implementation of the TRA in case China indeed invades Taiwan? Ronnie, would, would you like to go first? Uh, sure, happy to. And then I'll defer to you on the first on the next question. Um, so uh, I guess a couple of things uh, on this question. So first of all, I think um, as your question may suggest the Taiwan Relations Act was passed when we normalize relations with the People's Republic of China. So the, the existence or functioning of the TRA is actually not dependent on um, whether or not we have diplomatic relations with Taiwan or not. It was actually passed uh, uh, to, to, to help establish the types of relationship that we could have um, and to help define the US-Taiwan relationship given the absence of diplomatic relations. Um, in terms of uh, how it defines U.S. commitments to Taiwan, I think Ryan had mentioned, uh, well, well, so the TRA, even though it doesn't uh, require, it doesn't explicitly say that the United States needs to come to Taiwan's defense in the event of a Chinese attack, it does have language in there in, when, in which it says that any ch Chinese use of non-peaceful means against Taiwan will that will would um, significantly impact peace and security in the Western Pacific and will be viewed as a grave concern for the United States. So there is some language in there that would that could um, signal that there is some obligation from the US and to come to Taiwan's defense. But as Ryan mentioned, President Biden has been on the record as saying that the United States will defend Taiwan. And I would view what the White House and the US leadership says with uh, on Taiwan as really determining US commitment uh, to defend Taiwan. So the TRA will help provide a foundation, but what will be really important is to watch um, how uh, Vice President Harris, as well as President Trump uh, have and could potentially say about US commitments to defend Taiwan. Okay, Ryan, is there anything that you wanna add? No, I think I think Bonnie covered that very well. It ultimately will, will come up come down to a question of uh, the president deciding whether or not to intervene militarily in the defense of Taiwan. Theoretically, Congress has a role to play too because Congress declares war, uh, but Congress has not exercised that uh, capacity since the World War II. Uh, so they're a bit out of practice uh, in, in that aspect of the, the constitutional process. Okay. 
Uh, here's my second question. It's been more than 70 years since uh, Chiang Kai-shek's KMT, uh, Kuomintang, retreated to Taiwan, as you mentioned, Ryan, after defeat by Chinese Communist Party led by Mao Zedong. Younger generation in Taiwan probably do not know much about the historical background of the current escalating tension. Um, to me, I think it's a similar to the situation in the Korean Peninsula. The younger generation in Korea is not really interested in reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I visited Taiwan last spring with my students and learned that younger generation in Taiwan, they seem to be more interested in economic issues such as jobs, housing and environmental sustainability, um, entrepreneurship, etc. So I just wonder how much attention is younger generation or young Taiwanese pay to cross trade tensions? And if they have other alternative solutions, they think it may be better than the status quo? Well, it, I want to start with? Sure, it, it's, a, it's a great question. My, my impression uh, is that most people in the younger generation are generally comfortable with the status quo. The status quo means that they have a uh, democratic way of life. They have a free and open economy. They are able to travel uh, around the world. They have their own currency. Uh, they have their own military. And, uh, and would they prefer to have greater international recognition, dignity, and respect? Of course, uh, the people of Taiwan would prefer that. Uh, but are they willing to uh, risk the possibility of conflict in pursuit of it? Most people in Taiwan that I know would say no. Uh, and so uh, all things being equal, I think that your observation, Professor Peck, is, is correct, that, uh, that young people in Taiwan focus more on things that they can control and influence that will have direct impact upon their lives, such as jobs, housing, uh, because those are the, you know, the bedrocks of whether or not they will be able to get married, have children. Uh, and so uh, that has a very direct uh, impact upon their lives. Now, I will add that, uh, like in South Korea, just to use your analogy, uh, Taiwan has decided to expand uh, the length of conscription uh, for young people. Uh, and this will impact uh, their lives uh, and, uh, and may make them pay more attention to cross street issues going forward. Uh, but we'll have to see uh, that that's a, uh, that's a forecast, not an analysis. Thank you. Bonnie, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I very much agree with what Ryan mentioned. I do think though, um, there is probably a bit more concern among the younger generation now, having watched um, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So even though I think most prefer the status quo, I do think the international events and dynamics of the past two or so years have generally raised awareness within Taiwan, as well as within the global community, the mm -hmm. possibility that um, that they are facing a, a neighbor that wants to change that status quo. And they're taking it slightly, slightly more seriously than before. I see. Okay. Um, okay, here goes my last question. The uh, U.S. government has been using economic sanctions as a main vehicle or the means to punish aggression of country like Russia and North Korea against you know, our allies rather than direct military intervention. Former President Trump indicated in a recent interview with the Wall Street Journal, I think it's a few days ago, he would impose additional tariffs, say the 150 to 200 percent on China if China were to go into Taiwan, but didn't answer directly if he would use military force against the blockade on Taiwan by China. Given this past record, do you expect the U.S. government is more likely to rely on economic sanctions rather than military responses? Body described that you know a different range of the, the military responses in case of China's invasion into Taiwan. So maybe um, Bonnie, would you like to start with first? Yes. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I I see your video moving, but you're, I hear your voice stopping, so I'm trying to figure yeah, out yeah, when I should that. be speaking. Yeah, no, sorry about that. Very slow, so it doesn't synchronize. <laughs> sorry to the no audience. worries. Yeah. Um. So in terms of uh, using, so 
I think in a major Chinese contingency, major contingency involving China. So in a blockade scenario, the most likely scenario is a kinetic blockade in which China launches missile strikes on Taiwan first and then uh, implements a um, blockade around Taiwan. Or in the more kinetic, more dangerous scenario of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, in both of those cases, cases I think any U.S. government, whether you have a Trump administration or Harris administration, would think about uh, economic sanctions and economic responses. I think what's more uncertain and much more consequential is whether the United States would use force to defend Taiwan or not. I think right now there's a probably a more of a consensus among both Democrats and Republicans that we probably would support Taiwan if it's an, if it's an unprovoked attack on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing I think we will need to think through, any U.S. administration we need to think through is if China invades Taiwan and we are not there to defend Taiwan within the first week, Taiwan will not be able to stand. Uh, Taiwan will not be able to stand by itself uh, in terms of fending off the Chinese. And we've talked a, a bit about Taiwan will to fight and and the confidence within the Taiwan government. I don't think um, there will be enough will to fight in Taiwan and enough confidence in any government in Taipei if after a week, the United States is still not in the war to defend Taiwan. So that's a little different from Ukraine, right? Clearly Ukraine has done uh, quite well without the United States sending ground troops in, right? So I think the calculation is a little different. So on Taiwan, unless the U.S. administration is willing to see Taiwan fail in the event of a, uh, or be defeated or conquered in the event of a Chinese invasion, the response from the U.S. side will probably be we need to do much more than just economic sanctions. I see. Well, thank you so much. Ryan, is there anything that you want to add? No, I, the only thing I would add is that uh, I think that Beijing anticipates, expects, plans for the likelihood of the United States involving itself militarily in the event that Beijing initiates hostilities against Taiwan. Okay. That's their expectation. And I think that it's in our interest and in Taiwan's interest to keep it that way. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, at this point, I, I see the you know eight questions in the Q&A box. So I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Ms. Nola Wanta, the Senior Director of the Business Development and Strategy of CBA, to lead the Q&A session. Nola, would you take some questions from sure. the audience? Uh, for Dr. Absolutely, Lee? absolutely. So thank you, Ever. Absolutely. Thanks, Professor Peck. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and ask a few questions um, from, from, from everyone who submitted them. So thank you for submitting your questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, there's a couple of folks who thumbs up questions that would like asked. So I'll start with Davis's question since we talked a little bit about the status quo in Taiwan. And so Davis's question is, it seems like with the increasing t conflict and tension between Taiwan and China is an inevitable, including island quarantine. What, if anything, can the U.S. and Taiwan do to maintain the status quo? Uh, uh, Ryan so, so the, or Bonnie. So the question was, uh, what is it? Uh, is tension inevitable? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So question the the um, it's inevitable that something may happen. But what what if anything can the U.S. and Taiwan, as mentioned earlier, the status quo, especially with the younger generation, they like to maintain it. But is there anything else that we can do in the U.S. um to continue to maintain the status quo? Uh, happy to offer some thoughts uh, and then, of course, defer to Ryan to give a better, uh, more complete answer. Uh, so in terms of, I, so I don't think it's inevitable. I do think that um, we are uh, probably in more, we are in a course in which each side, uh, particularly on the, uh, the Chinese side, is set on its current path, but I don't think, for example, it's inevitable that China would necessarily invade Taiwan, nor is it inevitable that China would necessarily blockade Taiwan. And there's nothing written in terms of um, firm on the Chinese side, of, particularly in, with respect to Xi Jinping's timelines that says that he must unify Taiwan by a certain date. 
So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of China's overall calculus for Taiwan. So I think what the United States and Taiwan should try to do is um, make sure first that uh, China has to, China is not confident in its ability to take Taiwan. So a lot of what the Department of Defense as well as our national security community is focusing on is making sure that China does not have the capability to believe that it can successfully invade Taiwan if it wanted to quickly and easily, or that it can successfully blockade Taiwan if it wanted to quickly and easily. Um, so part of that is building up the capability to deter China from engaging in that type of adventurism. I think a second part portion that perhaps Brian might talk about a bit about more is we also need to make it such that uh, we also need to leave space for, for Chinese leaders to feel that they have more time on their end, right? If if, for example, within the Chinese leadership, they believe that everything is against what China would want, there's no hope of peaceful unification with Taiwan, that may also reduce the options on the Chinese side and force China towards a path of more use of, more consideration of coercion and use of force against the island. I, I think Bonnie's answer is great. I, I don't have much to add. Uh, the, the only, I guess the only thing I would offer is that it's important that leaders in Beijing not reach the conclusion that they can achieve their objectives quickly and at low cost. And the more that can be done to disabuse that perception in Beijing, the better the odds of forestalling the type of scenario that your, uh, your colleague asked about. Uh, and that's why uh, Taiwan's President Lai's efforts to build whole of society resilience so that everyone in Taiwan feels like they have a stake in defending their territory is important uh, because it helps chip away at this notion that, uh, that that China could use force to achieve its goals quickly and at low cost. But thank you, Nola. Thank you. So next is Jack's question. Um, as a longtime China and Taiwan watcher, I deeply appreciate your analysis. So thank you both. I agree that a Harris administration would likely follow a more institutional approach, whereas a T Trump administration would likely take a more transactional situational approach as he did in his first term. My question is, is, is are there many unpredictable tools left beyond increased weapon sales, tariffs and trade and financial policies, et cetera, that could be implemented without exploding the powder keg and overly provoking the CCP? In other words, it worked fairly well during the first Trump administration, but now that the CCP has had a number of years to prepare and hence is less novel non-status quo, can this approach still succeed in 2025 and beyond? I hope so. Uh, I, I, I wish I knew the answer, I don't. Um, I'm not sure what, um, unpredictable um, actions would be available. What worries me is that, uh, you know, creativity is usually a good thing, but it can be dangerous if it's, uh, if it's pursued by people who don't understand the, the context or history of, of the challenge. And one of the ways that you can have unpredictability is by linking issues uh, in ways that could be very dangerous or problematic for the 23 million people of Taiwan. So, you know, one way to be unpredictable is to, to offer a grand bargain, whereby uh, China uh, accommodates the United States on a significant issue to American people in return for the United States accommodating China's leaders on an issue of priority to them, which in this case most likely would involve Taiwan. Uh, as someone who, you know, cares deeply about Taiwan and its future, I, I'm deeply uncomfortable with that as a proposition and uh, would hope that that's not the type of creativity that would be under consideration in the event that uh, former President Trump is reelected. And uh, I'll, I'll add that I'm not sure these are initially unpredictable actions as more, uh, or they're just more, uh, I guess, a drastic actions. So we've definitely heard um, different folks advocating for different things for Taiwan. So some of the ideas that are a bit more out there include, for example, normal. Uh, U.S. recognizing Taiwan, normalizing relations with Taiwan, um, U.S. clarifying, um, changing from strategic ambiguity, strategic clarity, 
And then of course, there's also folks who advocate that we should be a lot more um, open, declaratory in terms of uh, not only the uh, um, current US operations uh, with Taiwan, but also deploying significantly more troops to Taiwan and, and significantly increasing our presence there. So I think um, all of those measures, I don't think are necessarily unpredictable. I, I think uh, it would, all those measures are likely to elicit a very strong and negative response from the Chinese side. And I think I would, I would say that we, we should question whether the strong negative response from the Chinese side may outweigh whatever, ben whatever benefits or advantages we have um, from, from engaging in any of these measures. Oh, wonderful. Thank you both so much. Um, so I'll choose about two more questions and then um, I'll send it over to Professor. Is that okay, Professor? Pop? Thank you. Okay, uh, great. Yeah. Mm. Great. So um, from one of our attendees, um, how do you both, both Bonnie and Ryan, think about the role of non-government actors in the U.S.-China-Taiwan relations? In particular, they're thinking about groups such as Falun Gong, um, I think it's Falun Gong and their epoch times that exert outsized influence on the Republican Party and are committed to intensifying conflicts across the Taiwan Strait. So it's a really interesting question. Um, I Look, I think that there are groups uh, that have a interest in seeing um, tensions between the United States and China inflamed. Uh, because they believe that it will help awaken the American people to the threat that uh, China poses to America's future and are willing to use a lot of different means to, um, to, to serve that goal. I guess what I would say is that I'm uncomfortable with using um, partners as pawns. Uh, the 23 million people of Taiwan have agency. Uh, they, they don't deserve to be treated as tools uh, to advance anyone's agenda, and I would hope that uh, that that would be respected. And uh, maybe I'll look at the positive side. There are also a number of non-government actors trying to promote a better U.S.-China relations too. So I would say that um, there are a whole range of non-government actors out there. Like Ryan said, there are some who have different interests, some who have uh, other interests. And I would, and I think, um, if U.S.-China relations um, are, are tense and competition is heating up. I would hope there are more non-government groups that promote conversations that are not possible at the official level. So track two discussions or more exchanges that will help both sides understand each other, even if at the official level, those types of communication may become more and more difficult. Okay, great. So one last question, and this is more for, um, well, for both Bonnie and Ryan, but first Bonnie, um, could you talk more about the um, the Coast Guard that you mentioned in your presentation? And then for both Bonnie and Ryan, um, do you think that there's any economic return on the investment for China so that they're spending so much money surrounding, sur sur like surveilling the Taiwanese Strait? Um, like, what's the purpose and all that and so forth. So but perhaps Bonnie, you can start and talk a little bit more about that. Sure, I can start with the Coast Guard and maybe leave Brian with a second question. So in terms of the Chinese Coast Guard, uh, unlike uh, the US Coast Guard, as well as most regional Coast Guards, um, the Chinese Coast Guard actually reports to its Central Military Commission. In other words, it, it is controlled by the Chinese military. Most other Coast Guards are uh, either firewalled off from the military or operate purely as civilian force. That's not the case with China. So that's what's so confusing when China deploys its law enforcement Coast Guard assets in these types of operations, because they're very much in conjunction with the PLA and they're under the command of the PLA, uh, sorry, of Central Military Commission. Um, so I raise it because I think uh, one of the recommendations my colleague and I have, or, sorry, one colleague I have at CSIS is we need to start categorizing China's Coast Guard as part of the PLA and not just view them as a normal Coast Guard. And that's my reason for flagging it because I think it's just categorically different. Nola, on your second question, look, I think that uh, the Chinese have invested an extraordinary amount of resources in developing military capabilities and the Chinese people 
expect that those resources will be put to use to serve the goal of uh, deterring China or Taiwan from drifting further away from China, of dissuading the United States and others from becoming more actively involved. And when, uh, when people in China see things that run against those interests, they ask, what is all this investment good for, if not to help prevent those bad outcomes? And so it creates a certain degree of um, pressure to show action uh, and to use the tools that uh, China has spent considerable resources developing um, to, to try to achieve those objectives. And so I, um, I think that what, we, what we're seeing is going to be with us for a while, and it's up to the United States and others to develop responses uh, that allow us to protect our interests in preserving peace and stability in the face of that. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. So now I think I'll return, turn it over to Professor Puck. Okay, Nola, thank you so much to, uh, for leading the Q&A session. Um, I see, you know, many great questions still that they're including the CPTPP and uh, close uh, economic relations between the Taiwan and um, PRC. So anytime you have a very intimate and then increasing economic relationship, it's going to be difficult to predict any kind of what uh, the conflict um, you know, uh, for any scale. So hopefully that there will be have another opportunity to um, discuss these uh, important economic questions. But unfortunately, um, we are running out of time. So I'm very sorry that we are not able to get to all the questions posted in the Q&A box. Uh, thank you again, Bonnie and Ryan, for talking to LMD community, as well as our external audience. I really, really appreciate it sharing your knowledge and insight into this uh, critical relationship between the US, China, and Taiwan. Finally, I would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in November during International Education Week. Um, please stay safe and healthy until then. Before you leave, I would appreciate it if you can complete a brief survey at the end of this webinar. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.